Hi, I'm Taylor Ricketts. I'm the director here at the Gund Institute, and this week we're hosting Paul Ehrlich, renowned biologist and author and interdisciplinary scientist. He's got a packed schedule of talks and meetings with students, but before he got started, I sat down with him quickly and informally in my office for a little chat about science, human behavior, and the future of the world. So let's see, let's start with the big picture on just how you see the world developing, what you think the most likely kind of trajectory is that we're on, and what's the best case scenario in terms of global development and sustainability. Well, I think the uh, business as usual trajectory is what we're on. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of talk about getting off it, but as you perfectly well know, uh, Every year there's more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Every year there are fewer populations and species of biodiversity. Every year there's more toxic chemicals spread from pole to pole. Every year the odds of a great epidemic go up as the size of the population increases and the absolute number of immune compromised people, that is people who are not well nourished, mm -hmm. goes up. The basic trajectory leads us to a collapse of civilization. The only issue, as far as I'm concerned and most of my colleagues are concerned, is can we turn away from that? Can we change human behavior enough so that we don't go on the business as usual trajectory? What do you think is the best case scenario? If we do change off this trajectory but we still have 9 billion people and we still have modernization of well, societies, how the, good could it be? The best case scenario is to only have 9 billion people temporarily and move it down towards a sustainable level. I personally would like to see a world go back down eventually to maybe uh, one or one and a half billion people at a maximum mm -hmm. uh, and have uh, most people be able to live the way uh, people in Vermont live. If we got what I would think of as an ideal world, then women would have exactly the same rights as men, uh, same job opportunities, same pay for work, and that would be a very good start towards getting the fertility rate down to a point where we could have a gradual reduction mm -hmm. uh, in population size, mm -hmm. although I think it's crystal clear to everybody who does the numbers that uh, we're going to have to adjust our population size more or less continually. It's not going to end up automatically at some yep. ideal place. Are there any sleeper environmental issues that people aren't aware of that are kind of peeking their head over the horizon now that we should become quickly more aware of that no one's talking about? Well, I, I personally, well, first of all, there, there are a number. Mm -hmm. It depends on how technical you want to get. There was an article in Science by, I think, Davidson recently pointing out that even if you have a stationary population and one level of consumption, that you're still facing the fact that we're moving towards collapse because you're always moving towards scarcer and scarcer resources, more difficult mm -hmm. to harvest, and so mm -hmm. on. Uh, the, uh, I think very few people understand the non-linearities in the system. Uh, one of, there's a, a very well-known book by Joe Tainter who's written a lot on collapse, and one of his main things about collapse, one of the main indicators, is diminishing marginal returns, the complexity, but just diminishing marginal returns. Well, think about it. The first oil well was in Pennsylvania. It was, went down 69 and a half feet and hit oil from the surface of the ground. Deepwater Horizon started under 5,000 feet of water on the bottom of the sea floor and went down two miles to yeah, explore for oil. Well, that's diminishing marginal returns. <laughs> We're seeing it everywhere. People yeah. are smart. We started with the richest resources that are now moving continually towards poorer ones. So that, the fact the bigger po the population is, the more danger of vast epidemics, well worked out by Bob May mm -hmm. and others years ago, is not on the... Well, so many things aren't on the public uh, platform. That's when the disease epidemics... The disease the epidemics, the, the, the uh, paper by Turco et al. showing that a, uh, a small nuclear war between India and Pakistan, which is not a zero infinity problem. I mean, a lot of jerks in, in Pakistan and India would love to have a war and so it would wreck us. Uh, so these are the things that aren't even up. You know, climate change is up there and discussed, mm -hmm. but it's being denied. The nicotinoid insecticides, which are now thought to be wrecking the, the, the honeybees, which are the main pollinators in many areas now that we've wiped out the native ones, mm -hmm. and so on. These things just aren't on the public's. Yep. But, but they could be. Yeah. 
you know, you're a father and a grandfather and now a great grandfather, right? That's right. right. How old are your great grandkids, or one well, of they're them? They're all under three. Okay. So when you sit there watching them run around being three-year-old kids, what do you think? You know, I've had a sine wave connection with this problem. When our daughter was 10 years old or five years old, I kept thinking, what a shitty world we're leaving to her. I've got to do something about this. Then she got old enough to say, Daddy gets stuffed. I'm not going to do it. And, you know, the, the urge to do it dropped off. <laughs> And then all of a sudden, there's a couple of cute little granddaughters running around in tutus and the same thing. And now, the great-grandchildren. I, I have actually a theory on this. I think that we have, being a small group animal, we have a lot of trouble relating to future generations in the uh, abstract. The ones we can relate to are the ones that we can identify their faces. You know, we have this wonderful brain mechanism that allows us special ability to identify faces. And you do get to know, if you live as long as I have, your children obviously very, very well. Your grandchildren pretty damn well. I mean, I drink with my granddaughters. One's about to get married. You know, they're, they're real individuals. The great grandkids, I can picture them, but that's about all because they're not living right where I am. But at both, that, that, as far as I can see, that would be the furthest out you can go. And so now that we've developed the technological capability to screw up my great-grandchildren's Grand, great grandchildren's world, we have a real problem of learning to relate. Nothing else you want to say? That's fine if you know. I, I think, I think cool. it, you've got plenty. That was great. Yeah, yeah. yeah.